Hello guys, welcome to chapter four, day four. I thought we should change the scenery a bit and I had a panic attack last night so I thought, what makes you happy? Pink, flamingos, the water on the river here at the bottom of my garden. So I'm still self-isolating but very lucky to have a river at the bottom of the garden. Half a bottle of rosé, so we're good to go. Spread some joy. So. Lady Vanishes Chapter 4. By the way, this will not be going in the river. No matter what happens, I will chuck this over. I'd rather go in the river myself than this. So no books will be harmed in the process of reading Chapter 4. So, Chapter 4, here we go. England Calling. Because she had a square on her palm, which according to a fortune teller signified safety, Iris believed that she lived in a protected area. Although she laughed at the time, she was impressed secretly because hers was a specially sheltered life. Just to say, I've just remembered after reading the first paragraph, um, the feather boa and the wig are inspired by one of my favourite YouTubers, Amelia Fart, who I love, think she's wonderful, has brought me so much joy in these past nine days of self-isolation. And yeah, just needing to be silly. Just, I really need to be silly at the moment. So we'll carry on. I'm holding onto this stick because this river is running really rapidly and I don't want to end up um, at the waterfall bridge north. So we're going to... And also this water is absolutely freezing, so I'm going to try and read this quickly. Right. Oh, sorry. One last thing. <laughs> I'm going to be stuck on this thing forever. One last thing. Um, a couple of wonderful people um, have told me that The Lady Vanishes is on the BBC. So this is Sunday at 3.40. Although I just realised the amount of time the last week has taken to upload. It'll probably be Tuesday till you see this. So I'll put it on Instagram as well. Like, go watch if you want to see the Alfred Hitchcock. But, um, it's quite different to the book, so you should read the book as well. Or listen to me reading it. Okay. Although she laughed at the time, she was impressed secretly because hers is a specially sheltered life. At this crisis, the stars, as usual, seem to be fight fighting for her. The mountains have sent out a preliminary warning. During the evening, too, she received overtures of companionship, which might have delivered her from mental isolation. Yet she deliberately cut every strand which linked her with safety, out of mistaken loyalty to her friends. She missed them directly, she entered the lounge, which was silent and deserted. As she walked along the corridor, she passed empty bedrooms with stripped beds and littered floors. Mattresses hung from every window and the small verandas were heaped with pillows. It was not only company which was lacking, but moral support. The crowd never troubled to change for the evening unless comfort suggested flannel trousers. On one occasion, it achieved the triumph of a complaint when a lady appeared at dinner dressed in her bathing sleeve. The plaintiffs had been the Mrs. Fudd Porter who always wore expensive but sober dinner gowns. Iris remembered the incident when she had finished her bath. Although slightly ashamed of her deference to public opinion, she fished from a suitcase an unpacked afternoon frock of crinkled crepe. The hot soak and rest had refreshed her, but she felt lonely as she leaned over the balustrade. Her pensive pose and the graceful lines of her dress arrested the attention of the bridegroom, Todd Hunter, according to the register, as he strolled out of his bedroom. He had not the least knowledge of her identity or that he had acted as a sort of guiding star to her in the gorge. He and his wife took their meals in their private sitting room and never mingled with the crowd. He concluded, therefore, that she was an odd guest whom he had missed in the general scramble. Approving her with an experienced eye, he stopped. Quiet tonight, he remarked. Refreshing change after the din of the horrible rabble. To his surprise, the girl looked coldly at him. It is quiet, she said, but I happen to miss my friends. As she walked downstairs, she felt defiantly glad that she'd made him realise his blunder. Championship of her friends mattered more than the absence of social sense. But in spite of her triumph, the incident was vaguely unpleasant. The crowd had glorified in its unpopularity, which seemed to it a sign of superiority. It frequently remarked in complacent voices, we're not popular with these people, or they don't really like us. Under the influence of its mass hypnoticism, Iris wanted no other label. But now that she was alone, it was not quite so amusing to realise that the other guests, who were presumably decent and well-bred, considered her an outsider. Just as an aside, I cannot feel my feet anymore, so this is really wonderful. Her mood was bleakly defiant when she entered the restaurant. It was a big bare room hung with stiff, deep blue wallpaper patterned with conventional gilt stars. The electric lights were set in clumsy wrought iron chandeliers, which suggested a Hollywood set for a medieval castle. Scarcely any of the tables were laid and only one waiter drooped at the door. 
In a few days, the hotel would be shut up for winter. With the departure of the big English party, most of the holiday staff had become superfluous and had already gone back to their homes in the district. The remaining guests appeared to be unaffected by the air of neglect and desolation, inseparable from the end of the season. The Mrs. Bud Porter shared a table with the vicar and his wife. They were all in excellent spirits and gave the impression of having come into their own as they capped each other's jokes, cold from punch. Iris pointedly chose a small table in the far corner. She smoked a cigarette while she waited to be served. The others were advanced in their meal and it was a novel sensation for one of the crowd to be in arrears. Mrs. Barnes, who was too generous to nurse resentment for her snub, looked at her with admiring eyes. How pretty that girl looks at a flock. Oh, blah, blah, blah. Frock, she said. All right, TC, sorry to my cat. Can we just say hello and listen? Afternoon frock qualified Miss Bud Porter. We always make a point of wearing evening dress for dinner while we're on the continent. If we didn't dress, we should feel we were letting England down, explained the younger sister. Although Iris spun out her meal to its limit, she was driven back, she was driven back ultimately to the lounge. She was too tired, she was too tired to stroll. Thank you so much, cat. She was too I mean, carrying on, I'm not doing this again. Um, she was too tired to stroll when it was early for bed. As she looked around her, she could hardly believe that only the night before it had been a scene of continental glitter and gaiety, a bit like me. Although the lack of quality had been imported from England, now that it was no longer filled with a friend, she was shocked to notice its tawdry theatrical finery. The gilt cane chairs were tarnished, the crimson plush upholstery shabby, a clutter of cigarette stubs and spent matches from the palm pot water lump to her throat. They were all that remained of the crowd. As she sat apart, the vicar, pipes in mouth, watched her with a thoughtful frown. His clear-cut face was both strong and sensitive, and an almost perfect blend of flesh and spirit. That is my next, well, it's my neighbour with a dog. So, just a nice interlude. He played rough football with the youths of his parish, and afterwards took their souls by assault. But it was also a real understanding of the problems of his women parishioners. When his wife told him of Iris' wish for solitude, he could enter into a feeling because sometimes he yearned to escape from people and even from his wife. His own inclination was to leave her to the boredom of her own company, yet he was touched by the dark lines under her eyes and her mournful lips. In the end, the dogs helped me read along. In the end, he resolved to ease his conscience at the cost of a rebuff. He knew it was coming because as he crossed the lounge, she looked at quickly as though on guard. Another, she thought. From a distance, she had admired the spirituality of his expression. But tonight he, was, uh, tonight he was numbered among a hostile critic. Horrible rabble. The words floated into her memory as he spoke to her. If you are travelling back to England alone, would you care to join our party? When are you going? she asked. Day after tomorrow, before they take off the last free train of the season. But I'm going tomorrow. Thanks so much. Then I'll wish you a pleasant journey. The vicar smiled faintly at her lightning decision as he crossed to a table and began to address luggage labels. His absence was his wife's opportunity. In her wish not to break her promise, she had gone to the extreme and had not mentioned her baby to her new friends, save for one casual allusion to our little boy. But now that the holiday was nearly over, she could not resist the temptation of showing his photograph, which had won a prize in a local baby competition. With a guilty glance at her husband's back, you have to stop. Sorry, my mum's filming this and she's laughing. You have to stop because I'm just going to first start laughing. This is a really great Mother's Day I'm making you do this. Best daughter in the world. Um, <laughs> um, we're keeping it a safe distance of a stick. Um, with a guilt, oh God. She could not, don't, I need to carry on, don't. She could not resist the temptation of showing his photograph, which would win a prize in a local baby competition. With a guilty glance at her husband's back, she drew out her bag a little leather case. This is my large son, she said, trying to hide my, this is what my mom said, this is my large daughter. <laughs> Just pink feathers, she's going down this river, anyway. Um, the Mrs. Flood Porter were exclusive animal lovers and not particularly fond of children, but they said all the correct things with such well known conviction that Mrs. Barnes's heart swelled with triumph. Good luck, kind of listening along to this and following this. Um, Miss Rose, however, switched, luckily it's not the most important chapter, and she says, Miss Rose, however, switched off to another subject. Directly the vicar returned from the writing table. Do you believe in warning dreams, Mr Barnes, she asked. Because last night I dreamed of a railway smash. The question caught Iris' attention and she strained to hear the vicar's reply. I'll answer your question, he said, 
If your first answer mine, what is a dream? Is it stifled apprehension? I wonder, said a bright voice in Iris's ear. I wonder if you'd like to see the photograph of my little son, Gabriel. Iris realised dimly that Mrs Barnes, who was keeping of England in limp round lace, had seated herself beside her and was showing her the photograph of a naked baby. She made a pretense of looking at it while she tried to listen to the vicar. Gabriel, she repeated vaguely. Yes, after the archangel. We named him after him. How sweet. Did he send a mug? Mrs Barnes stared incredulously while her sensitive face grew scarlet. She believed that the girl had been intentionally profane and insulted her precious little son to avenge her boredom. Pressing her trembling lips together, she rejoined her friends. Iris was grateful when the humming in her ear ceased. She was unaware of her slip because she had only caught a fragment of Mrs Barnes' explanation. Her interest was still held by the talk of presentiments. Say what you like, declared Miss Rhodes, sweeping away the vicar's argument. I've common sense on my side. They usually try to pack too many passengers into the last good train of the season. And I'll be precious glad when I'm safely back in England. A spirit of apprehension quivered in the air at her words. But you aren't really afraid of an accident, cried Mrs Barnes, clutching Gabriel's photograph tightly. Of course not, Miss Wood Porter answered for her sister. Only perhaps we feel we're rather off the beaten track here and so very far from home. Our trouble is we don't know a word of the language. She means, cut in Miss Rose, we're, we're all right over reservations and coupons so long as we stick to hotels and trains. But if some accident happened to make us break our journey or lose a connection and we were stranded in some small place, we should feel lost. Besides, it would be awkward about money. It didn't bring any travellers checks. The elder sister appealed to the vicar. Do you advise us to take my sister's dream as a warning and travel back tomorrow? No, don't, murmured Iris under her breath. She waited for the vicar's answer with painful interest, for she was not eager to travel on the same train as these uncongenial people who might feel it their duty to befriend her. You must follow your own inclination, said the vicar, but if you do leave prematurely, you will not only give a victory to superstition, but you will de deprive yourself of another day in these glorious surroundings. And our reservations are for the day after tomorrow, marked Miss Rose. We better not risk any muddles. And now I'm going up to pack for my journey back to dear old England. To the surprise of everyone, her domineering voice suddenly blurred with emotion. Miss Bud Porter waited until she'd gone out of the land before she explained. Nerves. We had a very trying experience just before we came here. The doctor ordered a complete change so we came here instead of Switzerland. Then the innkeeper came in and as a compliment to his guests, fiddled with his radio until he managed to get London on the long way. Amid a machine gun rattle of atmospherics, a familiar but mellow voice informed them, you have just been listening to, but they had heard nothing. Miss Fred Porter saw a garden, silvered by the harvest moon. She wondered whether the chrysanthemum buds, three to a pot, were swelling, and if the blue salvias had escaped the slugs. Miss Rose, briskly stacking shoes in the bottom of a suitcase, quivered at the recollection. Again she saw a gaping hole in the garden bed, where overnight had stood a cherished clump of white delphiniums. It was not only the loss of their treasure, but the nerve-wracking ignorance of where the enemy would strike next. The vicar and his wife thought of their baby asleep in his cot. They must decide whether they should merely peep at him or risk waking him with a kiss. Iris remembered her friends in the Roaring Express and was suddenly smitten with a wave of homesickness. England was calling. That is the end of chapter. Interestingly, they're talking about memories, kind of remembering being at home, kind of wanting to be back there. And at the moment, we're kind of all reminiscing, well, I am reminiscing about like actually being able to leave the house. Although, to be honest, I'm on a flamingo in a river. So I am living a pretty good life. So enjoy yourselves. I hope everyone's taking care. Keep distance from everyone, you know, social distancing, but have as much fun as you can. And um, I'm gonna drift on down the river a little bit kind of an end to this so bye see you later enjoy yourself